Okay, the third technique that we should know to analyze dynamics of a difference equation system is diagonalization. For that, we need one preliminary, which is linear transformation of variables. So if you don't have a good intuition about linear transformation of vectors, please take three to four minutes to refer to another lecture for that. Now, let us move on to our main topic, diagonalization. In our first class, I showed a very trivial multidimensional dynamical system in which there are two variables, k and x, but k depends only on its past value, and x t plus 1 depends only on its own past value. There are two variables, k and x, but they do not depend on each other. If you express such a system in the matrix form, then the coefficient matrix has a diagonal form. Off diagonal elements are zero. In such a case, studying dynamics is very easy. If the slope A is smaller than one in absolute value, then KT will converge to its steady state K bar. If C is smaller than one in absolute value, then XT converges to its steady state X bar. But in general, if there are two variables, kt plus 1 should depend not only on its own past value, but also on the past value of x, and xt plus 1 also depends not only on its past value, but also on the past value of k. So, if we express such a dynamical system in the matrix form, this first equation is the same as in the last slide, I just repeated it, if we express this system of equations in the matrix form, then the coefficient matrix is no longer a diagonal matrix. The question is, in such a general case, how can we understand, how can we analyze the dynamics of the system? Do k and x converge or diverge? Let us introduce new notations. So let's denote the vector of k and x together by a bold letter x, and let's denote the matrix of these coefficients A, B, D, E by capital A. And finally, this constant vector C and F by A0. So our dynamical system is expressed as the bold letter X sub T plus 1 equal A times bold X T plus A0. Now, this A0 is a little ugly, right? This term makes this linear system non-homogeneous. Do you remember that little trick we learned in the first class? The trick to convert a non-homogeneous linear system into a homogeneous system. That is, instead of considering x itself, we consider its deviation from a steady state x bar, and that way we can make the system homogeneous. The steady state should satisfy this equation, x bar equal a times x bar again plus a naught. If you want to know what x bar is, you can compute it. But the point was that by subtracting this equation for the steady state from the original system, this a naught disappears. So the result is x sub t plus 1 minus x bar equal a times x t minus x bar. So if you multiply a to the current date deviation, you get the next date deviation. Or, in other words, if you multiply a t times to the initial date deviation, you can get date t deviation. So we got a very intuitive expression. We are almost there. Next question is, under what condition does this deviation converge to zero? Under what condition does xt converge to steady state x bar. By the way, we started with this two-dimensional example, but in general there can be five variables or ten variables. If there are ten variables, then A is ten by ten matrix and A naught is ten-dimensional vector. So from now on, we are going to consider a general case. So let's treat this bold x as an n-dimensional state vector and capital A as an n by n coefficient matrix. Okay? So far we have reached this intuitive expression. 
the HT deviation from the steady state is a to the power t times the initial date deviation from the steady state. Now we want to diagonalize this system. In order to diagonalize this system, we should diagonalize matrix A. I will not explain details of diagonalization today. Diagonalization is one section of a linear algebra textbook. If matrix A is a numerical matrix, software like MATLAB will do it for you in seconds. And through diagonalization, matrix A is expressed as B inverse times capital lambda times B. Here, capital lambda is a diagonal matrix in which diagonal elements are eigenvalues of matrix A. Matrix B is a collection of eigenvectors, so the first column of matrix B is an eigenvector associated with the first eigenvalue, the second column vector of matrix B is an eigenvector associated with the second eigenvalue, and so on. If all the eigenvalues of matrix A are distinct, that is sufficient for diagonalizability, even if A is not diagonalizable, you can still do something very similar to diagonalization in which lambda is a Jordan canonical form instead of a diagonal matrix. But anyway, most of the time, a square matrix can be diagonalized, so today we assume that A can be diagonalized. Now we are going to replace this matrix A with B inverse lambda B, and we have this expression. Now, if we repeat b inverse lambda b t times, like b inverse lambda b, b inverse lambda b, b inverse lambda b, and so on, you can see that many b and b inverse that come in the middle are cancelled out. So what remains in the end are the very first b inverse, and the very last b, and all the lambdas that come in the middle. So we end up with the second expression. Now we multiply this matrix B from the left to the both sides and we have this third expression and we introduce new notation. We denote B times the date T deviation as WT and B times date 0 deviation as W0. Here, if you remember what we studied in the preliminary, W is just a linear transformation of the variable of our interest xt minus x bar. In terms of W, the system becomes very easy. Wt is simply lambda to the power t times W0. The system has now been diagonalized because if you break it down, we have this expression. The vector of w's is equal to this diagonal matrix lambda to the power t times the vector of initial w's. Multiplying a diagonal matrix t times is extremely easy. It's just each element to the power t. So this matrix lambda to the power t is equal to lambda 1 to the power t, lambda 2 to the power t, dot dot dot, lambda n to the power t. So, W1t is simply equal to lambda 1 to the power t times W10, and Wnt is simply equal to lambda n to the power t times Wn0. So basically, for each i, i equal 1 through n, we have Wit equal lambda i to the power t times Wi0. This simple equation holds for all i you can see that each w depends only on itself. So studying the dynamics is very easy now, and once we know the dynamics of w, we know the dynamics of x. If w converges, then x converges as well. And if x converges, then w converges, because w is just a linear transformation of the variable of our interest x t minus x bar. So, the ith w converges to 0 if lambda i is smaller than 1 in absolute value. If lambda i is larger than 1, then the ith w does not converge. If all the eigenvalues, if all the lambdas are smaller than 1 in absolute value, then this whole vector w converges to 0, that is, 
x converges to steady state x bar. Now, what if some lambdas are smaller than 1, while others are larger than 1? By the way, when you diagonalize a matrix, you can arbitrarily change the order of these eigenvalues, lambdas, as long as you also change the order of the associated eigenvectors in B. So let's consider, without loss of generality, the case where the first m eigenvalues of A are smaller than 1, and the rest are larger than 1. Out of n w's, the first m w's will converge, because the corresponding lambdas are smaller than 1 in absolute value. So no matter what the initial values are, first m w's will eventually converge to 0. They are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. In contrast, wm plus 1 through wn will not converge because these lambdas are greater than 1 in absolute value. So if you exponentiate them by t, if you multiply them again and again and again, they will eventually diverge. Unless these w's, wm through wn, are originally 0. If they are originally 0, then they will stay 0, but otherwise they will diverge. Maybe I should have written that these latter lambdas are larger than 1 in absolute value because these lambdas are sometimes complex. But anyway, so in summary, the vector w will converge to 0 if and only if wm plus 1 through wn are originally 0. If they are 0 from the beginning, then the whole w will converge because the rest of the w's, w1 through wm, will converge anyway because these lambdas are smaller than 1. So if you multiply them again and again and again, they will converge. This condition, the condition that w's corresponding to lambdas larger than 1 should be originally 0, defines an m-dimensional space in Rn, or maybe Cn, for initial values of w0. Actually, w0 is initial value of w, so this initial value part is redundant, but you understand what I mean. So geometrically speaking, if the system starts with a point that is located on this subspace, the system will eventually converge to 0, otherwise it diverges. But W0, if you remember the definition of W, W was just a linear transformation of x minus x bar. So W0, initial W0, is equal to B times initial deviation of x from x bar. So, x0 is simply the steady state x bar plus the inverse w0. So, if the initial x, x0, is equal to the steady state x bar plus the inverse times w0, where w0 satisfies this condition, if x starts with such an initial value, then x will eventually converge to the steady state x bar because such w converges to 0, and w converging to 0 is equivalent to x converging to x bar. So this defines another m-dimensional plane for x that goes through the steady state x bar. And this subspace is called the stable manifold of x bar. So a stable manifold of a given steady state is a subspace such that if the system starts with an initial point somewhere on that space, the system converges to that steady state. And otherwise, the system does not converge. Okay, this class got longer than I thought, so let's quickly summarize, shall we? So get an n variable n equation linear system. If it is not a first order system, then you need variable stacking. But once you get this expression, Calculate the n eigenvalues of this coefficient matrix A. If m of the eigenvalues are smaller than 1, the stable manifold has dimension m. Okay? Sometimes your system is not a linear system, nonlinear. kt plus 1 equals g of kt, where g is some nonlinear function. Then you need linearization. You locally linearize the system around a given steady state of your interest. Then you have delta t plus 1 deviation is approximately equal to the Jacobian of the function g evaluated at that steady state of your interest times delta t deviation. Then you call this Jacobian matrix, n by n matrix, A, 
and do the same thing. The stable manifold is no longer plane because the original system is nonlinear, so the stable manifold is a little curved. But anyway, the dimension of such stable manifold is just the number of eigenvalues of matrix A that are smaller than one in absolute value. Okay? So this is how you analyze the qualitative features of the dynamics of your difference equation system. Nowadays, software like Diner might do most of the work for you, but still it's a good idea to understand some basic idea of what we are doing in the dynamical system analysis.